Um, so it's, it's lovely to talk to you. Um, this talk is going to be um, more about the mathematics than consciousness. So my agenda um, was really to overview for you our work on the free energy principle as um, an offering that addresses the physics of sentience, the, an account of um, sentient behavior from a largely mathematical uh, perspective, or at least a, a sort of um, statistical physics uh, perspective. Um, at the end, I will just um, cover very briefly some perspectives on what this has to offer uh, a discussion of consciousness, but this, uh, what I'm talking about is not in and of itself um, a theory of consciousness. Um, it's basically a theory of or an approach to self-evidencing. So I'm going to overview what that means. Um, technically, I'm going to take the approach of asking what normative models of sentient behavior do we have available? And is it a way of describing all of those models um, in a crisp and clear and formal way? Um, and I'm going to take my lead from um, behavioral psychology and in particular uh, recent research in artificial intelligence and the imperatives that um, drive that kind of research. Uh, and the second part, part of the talk will be just an illustration of the ensuing mechanics of belief updating and sentience that come from the first principle account established in the in the first section. And I'm going to focus on a particular aspect of belief updating, um, namely um, epistemic foraging and how that emerges from this first principle account. And then we'll close with one slide on possible uh, utilities of this approach uh, for further discussion. So what is self-evidencing? Very simply, it's the assertion that everything that we are and do is in the service of maximizing the evidence for our models of the world. So uh, technically, what we're saying is that there are certain internal states and certain actions that we are um, uh, that um, we can avail ourselves of, and that we change our internal states and actions in order to maximize the probability of observable outcomes under some model of the causes, the latent, unobservable, sometimes called hidden causes um, of those observations. Um, to establish the sort of you know the um, the universality and the constant validity of this um, description of sentience in or sentient behaviour uh, in terms of self evidence and just unpacking this optimization this normative description in terms of things which a lot of people uh, may be familiar with. So first of all, if the probability of an outcome given say me or my model of the world is high then those are the kind of outcomes that are characteristic of me and that I will, um, in a mathematical sense, find attractive in the sense that they constitute an attractive set of outcomes to which I will be drawn or um, that I will typically solicit or occupy. And reading this probability, this evidence um, uh, in that sense means that I can interpret the log of that as some uh, value function. And indeed, I'm going to, um, quantify that in terms of a free energy function of some outcomes, given some um, beliefs or expectations about the causes of those outcomes. So maximizing value is simply a statement uh, that underwrites reinforcement learning optical control theory, or if you're in economics expected utility theory. And that's nice because if you were in information theory, the negative of this value becomes self-information or surprise, or more simply surprise um, that corresponds to a negative free energy, which means that as I'm trying to maximize value, I'm trying to minimize my self-information or surprise. And this can be read in terms of the principle of maximum mutual information, um, in terms of things like minimum redundancy or maximum efficiency, um, let's say uh, due to uh, Horace Barlow, and indeed the free energy principle. In turn, if at every moment I'm minimizing my self-information, I'm also look as if I'm minimizing my entropy in the sense that the expectation, the time average of surprise is just entropy. And that, of course, is the holy grail of things like um, self-organization, um, dissipative structures, 
uh, synergetics of the kind described by Haken. And if I was a physiologist, this would just be homeostasis, is keeping my observable um, states, my physiological states within some uh, plausible, viable bounds. There's a final perspective that I'm gonna exploit, which is a statistical perspective that this quantity here can just be read as Bayesian model evidence leading to accounts of belief updating and Bayesian decisions in terms of the Bayesian brain, um, on the perceptual side, evidence accumulation and things like predictive coding. So that's the, um, the basic premise. Um, technically, what is this free energy um, um, bound on this value or negative surprise? Um, I've just written it out here in terms of some beliefs cue about hidden or latent states of the world generating observations at any particular time in terms of a negative uh, energy and an entropy here. And the reason I've done that is just to highlight its close connection with James's maximum entry principle that maximizing value or self-evidencing is just trying to uh, maximize the entropy of my beliefs about the state of the world generating observations under constraints afforded by my generative model or my model of how those outcomes were caused, usually articulated uh, in statistics in terms of the likelihood, the probability of some outcomes given a cause, and some prior beliefs um, ab about the, the causes themselves, the states generating outcomes. I should say, when I talk about beliefs, I'm talking about Bayesian beliefs. These are non-personal, non-propositional, they're just conditional probability uh, distributions prior being conditioned upon a model. So that's the, uh, the structure of that. It's an important structure um, that can be unpacked in a number of different ways that um, afford a number of different perspectives on the, the normative or the teleological interpretation of maximizing uh, this bound on, um, on log evidence. Um, I've written it out here in terms of the log of the evidence of the expected um, uh, um, log evidence here in terms of um, the expected um, probability of some outcomes given a model and a bound that can be never less than zero. Um, this, um, I think, is a useful perspective or decomposition because it, it appeals to explicitly a model of how you think your observations were generated um, that you have to actually write down. And if you're in artificial um, intelligence or machine learning, it gives you for free explainable AI. What we will see furthermore is that when one takes this kind of approach to deciding what is the optimal thing to actually do in the, in the sense of soliciting or garnering new observations or data, this leads to a, a particular kind of Bayes optimality in terms of optimal Bayesian design, um, which in turn, if you were in industry, would have lots of implications for data foraging uh, epistemics, and one might argue um, uh, generalized artificial intelligence. There's another way of writing down this expression, which is, I think, equally informative. So all I've done is sort of move these terms around um, to express the free energy as the difference between accuracy and complexity, where accuracy is just, if you like, the, uh, the, the, the goodness of fit of your model. Um, in terms of being able to explain the data. And the complexity is just the degree to which I had to change my mind in order to provide that accurate account. It's a chaos divergence between my posterior beliefs, this Q, beliefs about states of the, um, generating the data, and my prior beliefs. So it's the degrees of freedom I've had to use up in order to provide an accurate account of some observations under a particular model of how those observations were generated. Um, this is useful because, of course, it, it, it's compliant exactly with Occam's principle, finding the simplest explanation that is um, not too simple in the sense that it accurately accounts for the observations at hand. Um, it's also a formal way to quantify the computational cost um, that practically, via things like the Janinsky equality and Landau's principle, also tells you if you're doing it the right way, you're doing it quickly and with a minimum amount of energy expenditure or metabolic cost. So you're looking for artifacts that are um, running with very small batteries or running very, very 
uh, efficiently in a thermodynamic uh, sense. But the key thing I want to do with this, um, this free energy functional, this way of um, writing down an optimization function that underwrites sentient behavior is to think about what it means in terms of deciding what data to gather next, how to act upon the world, which is why I talk about sentient behavior. So the behavior becomes quite crucial here. And the rest of my presentation is really just telling us a very simple story that if we choose to act or we select those acts that maximize free energy in the future, expected following an act, what we have for free is an account of self-evidencing in terms of two kinds of Bayes optimality. This notion of Bayes optimal design that I'm going to get those data that disambiguate my uncertainty about this, the, um, the states of affairs that I'm operating under, plus a minimization of risk in terms of making optimal decisions that we will see um, respectively maximize expected accuracy following an act upon the world and the expected complexity. Um, so just to illustrate that, um, I'm going to ask you to think about what you're going to do. So imagine you're an owl and that you're hungry. And then I'd, if this was an in-person audience, I'd, I'd be asking people on the front row, what are they going to do? And almost invariably, they correctly respond, well, I'm going to look for some food, which is clearly the right thing to do. But that answer has an enormous um, implication for the kind of functionals, the kind of objective functions that underwrite uh, behavior. I want to compare and contrast two particular kinds of approaches um, that you could choose between, um, deliberately emphasizing the differences, but I'm going to sort of repair the dialectic later on. Um, but for the moment, I could say, well, look, there's some value function out there associated with a state of the world, which I can't observe directly, if I took this action. And if I can find the actions to take from any given state that maximize this value function, then I have a, a, a state action policy that is optimal in the sense that it maximizes this function of states of the world. However, that's not the kind of policy that is, um, can accommodate the answer, I'm going to search for my food. Because in searching for my food, I am changing the attribute of a probabilistic belief, namely, I'm reducing my uncertainty about the location of my prey. This means that the function that we're chasing is not a function of states of the world, but a function of beliefs about states of the world, or a function of a function where that function is beliefs about the states of the world that would ensue given an action. So the fundamental difference between the value function of states and a functional, an energy functional of beliefs about states. Furthermore, looking for food brings something else to the table. It means that state action policies are not gonna do the job in the sense that it matters whether I look for my food and then eat it or try to eat it and then look for my food. So this more belief-based formulation um, brings to the table the sequences of actions and that the functional that we're talking about must be a com composition of um, beliefs of, over time. So we're talking about not just the current action, but the action into the future, the path or trajectory or a policy into the future. And this gives a very different um, sort of principle or mathematical basis for uh, optimization or a teleological take on self-organized behavior. Um, just mathematically, there this um, would conform to Bellman's optimality principle. And from that, you would get things like optimal control theory, dynamic programming, reinforcement learning, Bayesian decision theory, uh, state action policy durations, and all of that kind of approach. This, on the other hand, because it's optimizing a, um, a path interval or time interval of an energy function, um, then it becomes a principle of least action, homologous to Hamilton's principle of stationary action. Um, and this would, um, these kinds of approaches would fall under free energy principle, active inference, artificial curiosity, intrinsic motivation in robotics, optimal Bayesian design, reducing uncertainty by gathering the right kind of data and sequential policy optimization. 
So if we now pursue the belief-based um, principle of least action or stationary action approach, this is the kind of architecture that you get into or computational architecture that you get. Um, the idea is basically that you take your observations from the world, from, the, from your sensory organs. You first of all, optimize your beliefs about the world by maximizing this, um, also known as an evidence lower bound, it's bound on the marginal likelihood or the evidence for your model so that you get the best possible beliefs about the state of the world. And then you use those to evaluate the free energy that you'd expect following uh, under those beliefs, and then work out the plausibility or the probability in terms of an expected free energy of pursuing this action or that policy or that sequence of behaviors. And then you select the one that you think is going to maximize um, the expected free energy. You act upon the world, the world generates some new um, observations, and so the perception action cycle continues. So that's the basic idea. Um, I've rewritten those equations out um, in uh, slightly more detail here because um, although this, they look a bit complicated, there is a beautiful symmetry here, which, which um, um, I just want to unpack for you. Um, so I've just rewritten the two ways of decomposing the free energy here in terms of uh, a bound on log evidence that can just by switching these things around be expressed in terms of a KL divergence between priors and posteriors, the complexity and the accuracy here. And here's the expected free energy. And the only difference here is that we're basically evaluating this quantity under technically a posterior predictive distribution of outcomes that I might get if I pursued this particular policy. And what we get is that the complexity becomes risk, the accuracy becomes, or the negative accuracy becomes ambiguity, the evidence bound becomes an intrinsic value, and the log evidence becomes an extrinsic value. So what do I mean by these things? Well, these um, can have interpretations, again, which many of you will be familiar with. So let's just unpack and drill down on, say, the intrinsic value, the expected evidence bound here. So if I just ignore extrinsic value, um, what am I left with? Well, I'm left with this quantity here, which is just the KL divergence between my beliefs about states of affairs in the world when I have observed the consequences or the outcomes of a policy relative to not observing them. So it scores the information gain or equivalently the reduction of uncertainty uh, in the visual search literature, it's known as Bayesian surprise. Um, more simply, it's just the mutual information between the causes, states, and consequences, outcomes in the future um, conditioned upon a particular policy. And um, I can go on and start to remove various sorts of uncertainty and drill down on what this extrinsic value means. Um, so the first kind of uncertainty that I'm going to take off the table is uncertainty um, um, a due, that is induced by this ambiguity. And I'm going to do that just by assuming that I have direct access to the, all the hidden states of the world. I can see everything so that the obs outcomes become the states or the observations become the states. And when I do that, this term disappears and I'm left with this term here, which is essentially a KL divergence or a difference between the anticipated outcomes or states of the world in the future or their outcomes um, given a policy versus my prior beliefs about the kind of states or outcomes that me as a model of my world um, would typically encounter. So if we interpret these as prior preferences, then it's this risk just scores the difference between my, the anticipated outcomes and my preferred outcomes. And then in engineering, this is known as KL control, uh, and economics, it's known as risk sensitive control. So if I now take the final bit of uncertainty away, which is the uncertainty about the consequences of my actions, I'm now just left with no ambiguity and no risk, and now I'm just left with the expected value, this log probability of my preferred outcomes, um, 
and hence expected utility theory in economics. So just to rehearse what we've done here, we've taken the free energy, we've taken the expected free energy in the future, consequent upon an action, and then just taken away various sorts of uncertainty. And we've got from essentially a principle of least action back to the Bellman optimality principle. But in so doing, I've had to remove various sorts of uncertainty um, from the game. Um, but that even more simply, what we're saying here is that optimizing, extremizing expected free energy can be read as basically maximizing a mixture of your expected value, your negative surprise, and information gain. And these two, in turn, can be read as making optimal decisions that minimize Bayesian risk, whilst at the same time resolving uncertainty and ambiguity about your world through uh, um, conforming to the principles of optimal Bayesian design. So practically, um, let me um, show you how that works in, in, in practice. So uh, technically, what you have to do is um, to simulate this kind of behavior or to uh, understand and create sentient artifacts that comply with um, this kind of um, um, uh, belief updating and action um, referred to as active inference in my world. Um, you have to start with the generative model, and that's basically the key message of everything I'm going to say until the very last slide. Everything inherits from your model of the world for which you are trying to gather evidence, and if you are phenotypically that model, um, um, you can interpret that, um, as some people have, including Jacob Howey, um, as self-evidencing. So how do you articulate a model? Uh, a generative model, um, it, it is always possible to write down a generative model in terms of a graphical model. Um, and I've done um, sort of a generic discrete state space model here that we use, and I'll use in a second just to illustrate the kind of behaviors that ensue by maximizing um, expected free energy. Um, it, so here we've got a, a, a simple model with different states that. Uh, have transitions over time that depends on a probability transition matrix that itself depends upon the policy, where the policy is sampled from a Gibbs distribution um, whose energy is given by the expected free energy here. And then every state generates via a likelihood mapping, usually denoted by an A matrix, some outcome. And that is a complete description of my generative model of any world. Um, and here you can ignore the equations here, they're just. Um, write these, uh, this graphical model um, out in terms of e equations. Um, the interesting thing is, if you can write down a probabilistic graphical model, there is always a conjugate kind of model known as a factor graph. Um, I won't go into the details, all we need to know here is that the factor graph specifies the message passing that underwrites the belief updating. So there's always a message passing scheme for any given generative model. Uh, the key distinction between the graphical model and the factor graph is that the edges become the unknowns um, and the nodes become the, um, the, uh, the factors here. And we can interpret this in terms of Bayesian belief updating. So this kind of generative model um, leads to this kind of message passing that I've just um, annotated with the edges or the messages that are passed between um, different nodes in this factor graph. Um, this is nice because what it does is it provides a, you know, an off the shelf technology to articulate the belief updating in terms of a mechanics of message passing and belief updating um, that you can then see, well, are there artifacts out there that do this kind of thing and have this computational architecture? And indeed there are. Um, the, uh, the brains are probably the most um, compelling example of this. Um, so what I've done here, I've just lifted the, under this kind of generative model, you get this kind of um, what's called variational message passing um, that looks very, very much like neuronal dynamics and plasticity and learning and action selection um, in a brain. So, you know, all that we need to do is just to look at, well, what don't we know? What are we making inferences about? And we, we just don't know states of the world under any given policy. We don't know the policy that we're pursuing. I've also equipped this model with a precision parameter, which um, is not really central for the current arguments. 
So the belief updating about state just becomes a nonlinear function that you can think of as a sort of neuronal activation function of linear mixtures of observable outcomes and states in the past and states in the future. And the policy selection inferring the policy I am pursuing akin to planning or control as inference is just a standard classical softmax function of my expected free energy uh, weighted by my inverse precision here. Learning so transpires to be all formally identical to associative plasticity or Hebbian plasticity, just basically counting co-occurrences of things and building up um, parameters, connections in your generative model that underwrite the message passing uh, as you accumulate and learn the structure of your world simply by outcomes and uh, causes co-occurring or the state now and the subsequent states uh, co-occurring, allowing you to update all sorts of parameters. Here, these are just the initial states. And we've talked about action selection as just selecting the action uh, that is most likely under the policy that has the greatest posterior probability. And you can play all sorts of interesting games about assigning different parts of the generative model to different parts of the world. Here's one particular one where we've assigned policy selection to the striatum and the precision control to uh, the dopaminergic system. Uh, but let me now um, conclude by um, just giving you a really simple worked example of the emergent behaviors under this mechanics. Um, the example uses a sort of um, very elemental two-step task. Imagine that we have um, a subject here, a little mouse who's put in a tea maze, and the mouse has two moves, and it wants to secure bait or reward that can be either in the left or the right arm. Um, and it's in this instance got this interesting opportunity to do a bit of searching in the sense that there's an instructional cue here that tells it whether the bait is on the left or the right hand side. So this presents an interesting choice for the little mouse. It can either waste one of its moves and go to the instructional cue and then go and enjoy for the last move the reward because it knows exactly where the reward is or it can take a chance and go either to the right or the left arm, noting that once you uh, uh, go into one of these absorbing states, you have to stay there. So half the time it could spend twice, two moves um, with a reward, or half the time, two moves without. So from the point of view of the Bellman optimality principle, these have the same affordances, but clearly from the point of view of the, uh, the principle of least action, that has this uncertainty reducing aspect, then going to the instructional queue has, the, um, has clearly the, uh, the greatest expected free energy and will therefore attract or determine um, that kind of behavior. And indeed, uh, that's what happens. So here's um, the results of a simulation um, that just um, I'm presenting now, um, irrespective of the particular design or generative model, this is the kind of behavior that one sees. Um, here, described in terms of the initial states, the reward is on the left or the right. Um, this is the policy that was selected. Um, this is the outcomes and the um, expected utility. And this is the learning about the initial states, which was um, here, whether the reward was on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And what we basically see is um, in the uh, mouse inevitably goes for the epistemic policies, infers that it should be and, and therefore pursues an epistemic policy that maximizes this um, intrinsic value, this sort of uh, curiosity-driven, uncertainty-reducing um, epistemic uh, or explorative uh, policy um, in, uh, in the first instance. But what we've done here, is after the first couple of trials, we've always left the reward on the same side. So that as time goes on, the mouse learns that the reward, the context is most likely to be on the right, on the left hand side. And that has the interesting consequence that the epistemic affordance of resolving uncertainty by going to the instructional cues starts to wane over time because there's less uncertainty to resolve. The animal is becoming more familiar with its environment. And what that means is at some point, 
that extrinsic value, that utilitarian, pragmatic, uh, goal-directed, as opposed to information-directed um, seeking behavior, certainly now has the greatest um, expected free energy. And there's a switch in behavior to more exploitative behavior where it goes straight to the reward. There's a natural consequence of this trade-off or um, splitting of the expected evidence of free energy into um, this um, pragmatic and epistemic parts. Um, so uh, just to illustrate um, the, um, that epistemic part um, that is underwritten by having the right kind of generative model of your, of your world, um, I'm going to um, end by demonstrating inference under a deep generative model. So this is a slide we saw before where we have a generative model um, uh, in terms of a graphical model and the accompanying factor graph that prescribes for us, gives us um, the, uh, the message passing that we do the belief updating. Um, and what I've done here is simply put one of these generative models on top of another one to create a deep model. The, first, the other move that's been made here is that the probability transitions and time, if you like, evolves more slowly at the deeper or the higher model than the, um, the lower parts of the model. So technically what's happening here is that there's a slow part of the generative model that's generating states or contexts that change slowly. And at each point or each transition, there are some initial states that are much quicker, faster generative model at the lower level doing a little, if you like, mini epoch or trajectory for every cycle of the changes at the higher level. Uh, and I can write that down very simply. Um, this is a hierarchical extension of the previous one. This is the corresponding factor graph with all the messages, sort of evidence about the current context coming from the lower part of the model, while there are reciprocal messages that provide, if you like, prior constraints or contextualize the dynamics and the um, the sequence of behaviors and inference, perceptual inference at the lower level here. Um, and this is simple to engineer and to uh, run these um, message passing schemes to emulate inference under these deep and in virtue of these separate, the separation of temporal scales, diachronic generative models. Here, um, there's a sort of a very simple model of reading. Um, it is very simple. Um, in this instance, if we just focus on the lower level of the model, here are our causes and here are our consequences. So uh, the agent can basically see something in the center of its vision, um, which can be thought of as a letter um, in terms of little icons here. And it also feels where in the world, the word it is, um, it is currently uh, looking. And these outcomes are generated by hidden states, which essentially is, where am I looking? Um, and what's, what am I looking at in terms of a word that has a composition of um, different letters in iconic form here? Uh, so these are the labels of these combinations of letters here, flea, feed, and weight. So if I knew what the word was, I knew where I was looking, I could generate exactly what I would see and uh, where I'd feel myself looking. So this will be the first level, and I could infer what word I was looking at by scouting around the word. At a higher level, though, we can now put in um, the sentence from which that word came, or to put it another way, the sentence that generated the word. So now we equip the, um, the, um, the outcomes with basically which, um, which sentence am I looking at? Um, and um, if I can generate, um, or if I have a generative model of sentences, say flee, wait, feed, and wait, if I knew which sentence or what sentence and where on the page that sentence was, I can now generate the initial conditions for what word I'm currently looking at, and I can now generate the outcomes. So we have this kind of deep generative model uh, that we can write down for this very simple task and evince the following kind of uh, behavior. Uh, so this is a result of a typical simulation here where this little agent was reading the sentence, flee, wait, feed, and wait. Um, so just to uh, put a bit of um, anthropomorphic semantics on this, uh, you know, if there's a cat next to the bird, you run away. 
Um, although if there's nothing next to the bird, you do nothing. If there's some seeds next to the bird, you feed. So that's the sentence. And this is um, depicts where the agent acted. Now action here is just basically where am I going to look next? And it's driven purely by this intrinsic motivation or intrinsic value, this uncertainty reducing aspect of minimizing, uh, maximizing expected free energy. Um, and what we see is very much characteristic of real um, eye movements during reading. So what we have at the bottom are um, renditions of the posterior beliefs about this little agent, about the current letter and, and the um, ensuing word, and then beliefs about the actual sentence um, that is being accumulated over time. And the key thing from this simulation is the, um, the agent skips what it doesn't need to know and moves on to the next letter or the next word once she has assured herself um, with sufficient confidence that she knows what the letter must be. So as soon as she sees a, um, a cat letter, she, know, she knows that there must be, um, the word must be uh, uh, flea and she can move to the next word. And so I'm very, very efficiently harvest the right information in order to resolve uncertainty about what is generating this at both the first and the second level, so that by the end, there is an accrual or accumulation of evidence for the hypothesis that this was the best sentence, the best context that explains this sequence or trajectory of observations, active observations in the sense that they're accompanied by action. Uh, this is the, the same results, but I'm just writing them out in a different way here in terms of um, the different probabilities um, ascribed to different sentences by the higher level of the genitive model and the different probabilities assigned to the different words at the lower level. Um, and I've cartooned the separation of temporal time scales here uh, simply with this uh, line as it moves through over time, showing the slow accumulation of evidence for the, the first sentence, which is only resolved at the end because it's in the last word that discriminates between these two uh, sentences, and the fast switching of beliefs, posterior beliefs, about the word that's currently being um, perceived or assimilated, that's passing evidence up, um, accumulating evidence for um, the word here. I've used this format, um, and the final format I've used here is just to sort of take this, um, if you like, synthetic sim or simulation of neural activity, and then I've filtered it using the same filters that people in electrophysiology might use. And the reason I've done that is, um, just to show that this has a degree of validity in relation to empirical neuron responses in terms of pre saccadic delay period activity, the prefrontal cortex, um, that when filtered looks very much like perisaccadic field potentials during active vision um, in um, animal experiments. So uh, I show that just again to try and establish a, a point of um, validity or construct validity with empirical um, neurobiology and message passing. This is the final slide. All I've said is that there is a mechanics of um, sentience available, should um, you want to subscribe to this. If one did, um, then you need to write down the generative model, which means that all the questions and all the different flavors of sentient behavior really inherit from the kind of generative model. Um, and now I'm trying to make this relevant for a conversation about consciousness. Um, and this, th th this is a sort of uh, a series of ideas that came out of discussions um, with an application to the um, Templeton Foundation to try and compare and contrast active inference with um, um, integrated information uh, theory. Um, so just very briefly, the different kinds of generative models may um, usefully mapped to different kinds of distinctions, um, uh, you know, in a, in a very commonsensical way in consciousness. Um, so, for example, the difference between unconscious um, inference and conscious inference may rest upon having deep generative models of the consequences of action that necessarily entail counterfactuals. They entail agency and autonomy in the sense that it is me acting or the model that is acting. Um, and action clearly speaks to some degree of embodiment. The next level of questions, well, what kind of generative models would you need 
to actually have qualitative experiences um, and to um, um, infer that you are seeing something. Um, and usually the story unpacks in the, um, along the lines of there being some kind of mental or covert action um, that depends upon the precision or the confidence that you ascribe to particular beliefs during um, during the belief updating. So it's a it's a, you know it's beliefs about the nature of the belief updating that inherits from uh, the uncertainty, and then finally con questions about self awareness and uh, minimal selfhood speak to different parts of a generative model that where the self now becomes a part of the generative model that is just a hypothesis or a hidden state that provides an accurate explanation uh, and a simple explanation for all of the belief updating and um, mechanics that are going on uh, underneath or at lower levels or more shallow levels of the, um, of the generative model. So I've been talking for 44 minutes. So I'm going to finish now um, with um, Einstein's uh, famous tic-tac. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And that is certainly true in terms of self-evidencing in the sense that you want to maximize the accuracy uh, whilst uh, uh, maintaining the simplicity of your explanations. And with that, all that remains is for me to thank uh, um, the people whose ideas I've been talking about. Uh, and of course, to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you so much for your talk. That's uh, absolutely wonderful. And um, so we've now come to the point where we uh, open up the floor to see whether there's some uh, questions. I'm sure that there will be people who want to dig deeper and we've got some time to do so. So it's a great opportunity with Carl here uh, to, to ask him um, about, about the free energy principle. So oh, I've got some hands up already. Um, okay, so Johannes, would you like to, to start? Um, yeah, I would very much like to start. Thanks very much. So that was um, quite interesting. Um, thank you. Um, so I was just wondering whether you con could contrast the proposal which you had on the last slide in particular, like co the difference between conscious and unconscious inference, um, and that being somehow tied into a deep generative model. If you could contrast that a little bit with, you know, the, the usual higher order thought kind of idea, you know, some higher order thing which somehow has to process some lower order thing. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think it's a slightly simpler distinction. I think I think sort of higher order thought theories um, are really much more about sort of um, a metacognitive, a representation of your inference um, that practically you know you have to do during the inversion of any generative model. Um, you know, in the sense that you have to assess your confidence in your. Um, in your beliefs or your inferences. And there's nothing magical about this. We do it every day um, when making inferences with things like t-tests or certainly in hierarchical generative models within between subject effects. We have to estimate the precision of our beliefs about the uncertainty in terms of the degrees of freedom and like. So as soon as you start to actually estimate the degrees of freedom um, in a model, then you have a kind of uh, metacognition in play um, that you know um, could be read as um, you know you as agent gathering data and gathering these number of observations. That is much simpler than just doing the t test by pressing the sort of the button on your SPSS or your software package. So the first distinction I was talking about was actually slightly simpler than that. Um, you 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 can run this kind of model. You can develop very very simple generative models that don't have this higher order or hierarchical structure that would be perfectly fit for purpose, say, to simulate a, a, a thermostat or, or, or a virus um, that wouldn't have this higher order aspect, but would, at some point under the hood, have an implicit model of the consequences of action. So a thermostat, by its engineering, or if it was a very sophisticated thermostat, by its wiring, um, would know that, or you could um, reverse engineer it, that it has an implicit generative model that things will change in terms of its thermoreceptors if it switches on a heater or not. So it was that sort of um, prospective depth that I was talking about. You know, having a generative model of the consequences of actions. Because usually um, in machine learning and statistics and also in much of sort of um, 
perceptual um, uh, research and say vision research, people have very, very beautifully crafted generative models that are fit for purpose for scene classification and scene construction and, uh, uh, and the like, or recognizing things. What we're talking about here is generative models that include action as part of the unknown causes of the, sens of the sensorium. And that kind of model has obviously, oh, so self-evidently, has to include the future. So it was that very simple move from uh, a generative model of the present or static outcomes to a model of controlled outcomes. And then you put on top of that hierarchical depth and sort of um, you know, an HOT like or metacognitive or hierarchical inference that then takes it takes it takes you to, to, to the next level. It, does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. That's great. That's great. So it's no hell Kashmir Kashmir um sorry I forgot your name though. <laughs> Please go on. It's all right. Yeah, you said it very well. Thank you very much for giving me the chance. Uh, Professor Friston, thank you very much for the talk. It was very illuminating. My my question might be quite uh, not directly related to the modeling, but uh, in uh, several different papers of yours and uh, people who work on the free energy principles, there is this emphasis or there is a, the references to the embodiment and uh, inaction. And that has been caused certain level of at least to me, uh, confusion when I want to understand free uh, energy principle from the mathematical perspective and the way that has been taken by, uh, let's say, inactivism, for instance, and the embodiment. And uh, I, I, I personally feel there is a, a little bit of a confusion and at the same time, uh, far-fetchedness towards how this embodiment and agency has been actually attributed from that perspective. Would you please mind to, to have some words on that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the, the, the simplest thing to say is that active inference is, is quintessentially an active. Um, you know, as soon as you talk about um, um, an agent or a system or anything that's separable from its environment in exchange with the environment, um, from the physics perspective, um, you have to talk about trajectories and paths and dynamics. And that you necessarily entails um, a reciprocal coupling between the agent and the environment and that from the environment to the agent. So the, you, know, the, you can't get away from the, 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 uh, the inactive, the situated aspect of that exchange mm -hmm. that underwrites the belief updating. In a sense, that's exactly you know, the distinction that, 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 that um, in response to the previous, to, to, to um, uh, Johannes's question, you know, the, the, this is just taking generative models into the world of actively exchanging with the source of data, basically. Um, so then all the mechanics of that, um, of the kind of data that you can solicit, what is the world you're trying to model? And of course, 99% um, of, the, of the, the world you're trying to model uh, from the point of view of a neonate is going to be your body. You know, what we, you know, did I cause that? Did mum cause that? Um, it, you know, do the, the very fact that I can control things may be a very late hypothesis that can be confirmed. Um, that, that first rests upon building a generative model of your motor plant in your body, and not just the motor aspects, but also the interceptive autonomic, the gut feelings. All of these things have to be have to be modeled so that they can be suitably predicted, so you can roll out into the future um, uh, under the, um, the hypothesis or fantasy that I'm in control of that or I'm not in control of that. You know, it doesn't matter. These, these, these are hypotheses that you will come to learn by optimizing the model. So I, I would put this, um, I put active inference certainly as a corollary of, of, of the sort of physics version of the free energy principle, very, very clearly in the inactive camp, in the situated camp. Um, um, and yeah, you know, when you start to get very practical about it in terms of the 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 the, the actual um, plant that um, that um, is the interface between the your the belief updating and the thing that you're belief updating about, that then you have to become very practically embodied. And you have to write down very very carefully. For example, simulating simple things like eye movements. You really have to think very carefully about how quickly can you move your eyes. 
Um, you know, so these things become very much center stage once, you know, once, is that the kind of distinction or was there something more philosophical? Are you talking about radical um, inactivism? Is it, uh, that's exactly, yes, ah, that's exactly, yes. that yeah. makes me quite confused when I think about it. Yeah. And, uh, I cannot actually have my head around it. That yeah, it I see. Actually... Yeah, so I won't speak to that because um, people, uh, people um, on both sides of the fence, um, you know, and my, a lot of my friends, people like Sean Gallagher and, and Jacob Harriman, are like this, they, they try to sort of um, d dissolve that, 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 that sort of um, any tension between active inference and inactivism, but they always leave radical activism undealt with. <laughs> so certainly, I don't, radical inactivism would have no place in this mechanics. Okay. You know, you know, there's something quintessentially representational about beliefs. Well, as soon mm -hmm. as you write down a belief about hidden states of affairs out there generating your data, unfortunately or fortunately, you're committing to a mathematical representationalism, which radical inactivists won't let you do. Exactly. So it's very difficult to talk to radical inactivists. Yeah. You Thank talk. you very much. You, you, you definitely clarified that at that point that I was actually looking for an answer. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, that was a great question. Uh, I was going to ask a similar question. <laughs> um, so, uh, Nguyen, would you like to ask yours? Yeah, thank you very much for your very clear and impressive talk on the basis of your large work. Um, one question is about metacognition. So you highlighted that metacognition is a candidate for conscious experiences. From the animal investigations, a metacognition was shown by Hampton and others in chimpanzees, which seem to have a very implicit, unconscious sensitivity how good their memory is. It seems to be that a lot of metacognitive processes remain unconscious. Why do you think that metacognitive processes in your model are closely co connected to conscious processes? And if so, can you relate that to any evolutionary benefit or how is your theory related to evolutionary benefits? That's an excellent question, uh, which I haven't got time to answer uh, in, in, in com uh, completely. Um, but the, just to deal with the evolutionary aspect. So um, from the maths perspective, uh, natural selection is rewritten as Bayesian model selection using exactly the same free energy functional. So um, the evidence or the free energy um, now becomes the adaptive fitness. It's just the probability that the, your, this model is, uh, um, is, is there, or certainly the outcomes, um, the physical outcomes experienced by this model is realized in a population. So um, evolution is um, read as um, optimizing the structure and the form of the genetic model in the sense of structure learning as you get in say radical constructivism. Um, why would part of that structure learning um, entail um, different levels of metacognitive like processes? I think the answer is very, very simple. It's just that when, you, when you're um, encoding or parameterizing beliefs, there are at least two attributes. One is, if you like, the sort of the sufficient statistic that locates your probability mass over this content. You know, it's big or small, nice or nasty, uh, fast or slow. Um, and then there's another sufficient statistic, which is the uncertainty of the dispersion. Um, and to, to, to completely optimize your belief structure, you have to do both, which brings to the table a whole uh, if you like, other anatomy, which is not just about recognizing or detecting this edge or this person or this mood. Um, it's actually also estimating the uncertainty about it. And I think it's that um, operation of estimating the uncertainty, in my world, this is the inverse uncertainty, it would be the precision, um, that has to operate at every hierarchical level. And I think you're absolutely right that, you know, we have to, uh, and indeed in simulations and indeed in terms of uh, analyzing data, you have to estimate the precision of the data at very low levels, which will be a long, long way away from anything that was personal or conscious. Um, and we do that every day again, you know, when doing a T statistic, when we estimate the standard error, we are estimating a belief about the amplitude of random effects, our uncertainty about our inference and our uncertainty about the data. If one takes that kind of precision prediction or precision estimation, so from the predictive processing point of view, we're now talking about 
not the predictions of content, but the predictions of the precision of the content. Um, if one that takes that up to a particularly high level in a hierarchy and associates it with a, an internal hypothesis that it is me estimating the precision, then it is that kind of metacognitive processing that I, I thought might be a candidate for um, possibly not self-awareness, but certainly, you know, there is selfhood implicit in that that might have a certain kind of consciousness associated with it. So that's what I was talking about before about mental action, that, you know, estimating the precision of various beliefs in, uh, encoded low in the hierarchy means that you're acting on the belief updating lower down to optimize it as you have to. And that, that kind of very high level precision optimization may be the kind kind of covert action, uh, internal action, action upon your belief updating that might be sufficient to house a conversation about consciousness. Thank you. If I'm allowed to make only one remark, I think it's very convincing that this brings in some self-component, but this self-component may be separated from the conscious dimension, but that's in a further debate. Thank you very much. <laughs>